Today, I'm going to be sharing some charcoal drawing tips and my new special needs red eye tree frogs. I work in a lot of different mediums, a lot. There are several reasons behind why I might choose to work in one medium for a project over another. Sometimes acrylics are just better for a design, they're easier to make changes in. Sometimes I like colored pencil because I want super, super tiny detail. This week, my decision on what medium to work on was based on time. I needed something I could get done fast because my pet care routine got thrown off a bit and I needed some time to adjust to the additional time spent there. I had my normal pet maintenance to take care of, like water changes for my reef tanks, and the normal care of my frogs. The difference this week was I had a new buddy for Murky coming into town. Murky's been all alone in her huge vivarium for months. I'd hoped that the purple red-eye tree frog would make it into that vivarium, but after three months, we're still struggling with some of his medical issues. It looks like we've cleared him of the initial diagnosis of parasites, but he still some, has some other things going on. So we may need an additional trip to the vet to see if we can figure out what is going on there. But for now, he is still in quarantine. Now that Glitch has moved into my office, that left room in my quarantine space to finally bring in a buddy for Murky. All new frogs have to go through quarantine just to make sure they don't have any hidden illnesses that might make your other healthy frogs sick. A day or two before this beautiful boy was to make his trip to his new home here in Dallas, his breeder asked if I was interested in taking on some special need frogs. How could I say no? Eee! They're here, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here, they're here. They're here. Meet Quasifrago and Sir Finley Mergleton. Quasifrago has a deformity where his head and body meet. He also can't extend one of his arms forward all the way. Sir Finley, I have no idea if these are male or female yet, but he needed a murloc name from World of Warcraft and appeared to be quite adventurous, so... Anyway, Sir Finley can't extend either of his front arms forward all the way. I have no idea what their life expectancy is. Sometimes with an animal, when they have an external deformity, there may be things that are off internally as well, so I'm really not sure how this is going to go for them, but I wanna give them the best life that I can. Once they're finished with their quarantine, I will build them a fancy vivarium too. So back to the point of this story, I now have three quarantine tanks to take care of on top of my usual animal care. Each of these tanks needs to have their crickets replaced, water changed, and paper towels changed every single day. Eventually, once everyone is out of quarantine, maintenance goes pretty quickly. But for now, as I adjust to the added care needed, I was super far behind this week on artwork. So I needed to come up with a project that was fast, but I also was really in the mood to draw something very detailed, realistic, and dramatic. And that's the story of why I decided to work in charcoal. Charcoal is probably the fastest medium I work in. It's great for detail, but also really easy to blend. Plus no dry time. I got this entire drawing done in one night. That's pretty unusual even for me. I'm fast with painting and drawing, but charcoal takes that to a whole other level. If you are supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over where you've got the real time pencil stroke by pencil stroke lesson on this one if you wanna follow along. For Patreon, as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. I have 200 available instantly when you sign up and a new one every single week. If you're not sure if Patreon would be a fit for you or if you want to see the type of videos I have available, you can head over to my Patreon video library on my website. I will have a link in the video description so you can check those out there. On to this demonstration. I am working on a nine, or sorry, I don't know numbers, 12 by 16 inch Canson Me Tens. This is the gray paper. I love this stuff for charcoal. I'm working on the rough side so that the charcoal has more to grip to. You can draw it on the smooth side, but it just doesn't stick as well. I definitely like the results I get better on this rougher side. When I'm working in colored pencils, I like the smooth side. 
So starting out, I got everything sketched out. I'm using a combination of white and black charcoal pencils. The white pencil is the generals, and then the black ones are the peel and sketch. And I'll have links to the, the supplies that I'm using in the video description. One of the things that's so, so great about charcoal, it is one of the least expensive mediums to get started with. Blending that out with a little makeup eyeshadow applicator. I don't know anyone who uses those to apply eyeshadow, so here's a good use for them. You can also use soft tools. They're really nice for blending your charcoals. I've got some blending stumps I'm using in there too. So I had to start with getting everything pretty dark inside that ear so that I could then layer the white detail on top of that. Now the peel and sketch charcoal, they are a much thicker lead, but they're nice because you don't have to sharpen them. You just peel some of that outer casing off. That's the little string you see there. You pull on that, you peel the paper off around the charcoal and it exposes it. But it's not gonna get super, super fine detail just like that. You can take like a piece of sandpaper and grind that down to a sharper point if you like. But what I do, what I find to be faster and easier is just to use my white charcoal pencil to clean up the finer details. So I can get that initial shadow down with those bigger kind of bulkier charcoal pencils. That one right there is the peel and sketch. And then use the white one to fill in between. And it creates that tons and tons of detail, but very, very quickly. Now my next tip for you, when you are working on an animal like this, it can get very overwhelming with all those strands of fur. I don't need each individual hair to be exact in order to look realistic, but I do want to watch that the fur is moving in the right direction. So what I do is just break it up into between this spot and this spot, this is the direction the fur goes into. And then I check my reference photo for the area in the next two spots, because that fur is going to change directions constantly. So use what you've already Already drawn out to check your work against itself. If I know the fur is going kind of up and down on between two given areas, that's what I'm going to do in my work. And if you can break it up that way, it makes it so much easier to tackle and get that realistic direction in where the fur moves. The other thing you want to watch for is how the fur clumps and clusters together. You don't want to just put random lines all over the place. Then you have confetti fur. It doesn't look realistic. And I don't care how much detail you add that way. If you're just putting a whole bunch of lines just so that you feel like you've got detail, that does not make it look realistic. The fur has to be about the right length. It has to go about the right direction. And it doesn't have to be exact, but that about is important. It has to be close to what you've got on your reference photo. The next thing you really want to watch for are your values. Now, the first thing I'm going to do, if I'm working in black and white, I'm going to take my reference photo and make that black and white too. It's going to make it much easier for you to judge those values. If you're looking at a photograph that's in color, it's really hard sometimes to translate that into how dark do I go here? How light do I go here? So by starting with a black and white photo, that will make your life a lot easier. Now here on the bridge of the nose, this is going to be one of the areas that can be very challenging. You wanna get the detail in there, but you have to be careful because if you do the detail wrong, you'll end up making it look like his fur is really long on the bridge of that nose, which it should not be. So look how little these little, they're almost little smudges. It's not even full lines of fur. And look how they switch direction. I'll soften that a little bit with a blending tool there, but notice the direction they're going into and how they clump and cluster and group together. That's such a big deal when doing fur to avoid confetti fur. And it's the same thing if you're drawing a person, just putting in a bunch of individual, you know, top of the head to the bottom, wherever the length of the hair is, strands of hair is not going to look realistic. Well, it'll kind of look like oily zombie hair, but it's not going to look like soft natural hair. Look at how soft these these bits are where they are grouped together. I blended, just soften them a little bit, but you're getting highlights and you're getting detail on some of the, the strands of fur, but not all of them. And they're not just random detail all over. A lot of times when you want something to look more realistic, less detail is what's going to look better. So like I was saying before, if you just put a whole bunch of random lines everywhere, yeah, you've got a ton of detail, but it's not 
correct detail and it won't look realistic. So less detail in that case, paying attention to which direction the fur goes to, you know, simplify things. That is what's going to make your work look more realistic. The other big thing for making your work look more realistic, assuming that's your goal, if you're watching my video, I'm assuming that's what it is, uh, is to pay attention to your values. Are your darks dark enough and your lights light enough? That's going to be the thing that will make the biggest difference in your work. If you have the perfect drawing, but your darks aren't dark enough, your lights aren't light enough, it's just going to be boring and it'll be very flat. By paying attention to where things should be dark and where things should be light and, get, and really playing up that contrast, get the darks really dark, the lights really light, your work will be more interesting to look at and it will have more dimension. One of the things a lot of people get hung up on is color. If I just knew what color to paint something, if I had the perfect tan, the perfect orange, the perfect whatever, that's going to be the thing that would make my work look realistic. No, it really isn't. And you can see that here. I mean, I'm working with just black and white and it looks realistic. It just looks black and white. It would be the same thing. Let's say I worked in purples. It would still look realistic if my values were correct. He would just look like he was under purple lighting. So paying attention to your values, that's going to make a big, big difference. Don't get yourself hung up on finding the perfect color if you're working in colored pencils or painting or whatever. Get the darks dark enough, lights light enough. And one of the things that's so great about charcoal is it is the perfect medium to practice that because it is so fast. You can do a lot of little quick studies and really practice making the darks a little bit darker, make your lights a little bit lighter. I and mean, sometimes maybe you'll, you'll push it too far. Maybe it'll be too dark or too light, but that's how you're going to learn. And in a medium that works this quickly, you're going to learn that much faster because you're going to get more work done in that short amount of time. I can't talk, words are hard. That short amount of time. Again here, look at the direction of the fur. Look how it constantly shifts. And I'm doing the same thing that I mentioned before where I'm just loosely shading in where the dark areas go and then the main detail is being done with that white pencil. Now, I'm using three tones of charcoal here. I've got the soft, medium, and hard. So the soft, it's going to blend smoother. It's going to be a bit darker, and it's going to blend out much, much softer. The medium is going to be in between that, and then the hard is going to be better for smaller detail. It holds its shape a little bit more. So when I worked around the eyes where I was trying to get crisper lines there, then I went ahead and switched to the hard. But if I could only, only choose, for I cannot talk today, if I could only choose one of those charcoal pencils, I would go with soft. I think that I can get everything done I need with that. So if it seems a little complicated, you can sim simplify that. But all three are nice. And like I said, it's a fairly inexpensive medium. So trying and playing around with those different pencils, see where it works best for you. And here that fur is really, really short, right? As it transitions into the area under his eye, it'll get longer and longer and still shifting directions. And I'm doing the same thing that I did on the head where I find two spots. I've already established this is where these spots go. So I look at my reference photo and at the area in between those spots, which direction is that fur moving? You also want to make sure that the fur is overlapping at each other in clumps. It's not those random confetti lines we were talking about. Look how they group together and how they overlap. Another thing is that all of these lines curve at least slightly. There really aren't any perfectly straight lines. If you do a lot of straight lines, it's going to have a very stiff, very unnatural feel. If you can make these lines just slightly curved, that's going to give you a more realistic look. Now blocking in the spots again, they were already sketched in, but I want them to be a bit darker. And then once I get those in there, we'll blend that out and I'm going to do the same thing. This is really just rinse and repeat at this point where we'll come back through, pick a couple of spots, which direction is the fur moving in between those two spots. I'm darkening the area in between the spots here. And what will happen is when I put the white on top, the, this will make the shadows in between those clumps of fur look a little bit deeper. Now watch when you're blending. Charcoal blends really easily and it could be very easy to over blend it. Just a couple of, of little strokes, whether it be with a blending tool or a Q-tip. Here I'm using that, the eyeshadow little applicator thing, technical term there, I'm a pro. But whatever tool you're using when you blend, you don't really need to blend and blend and blend. Just a little bit is normally enough, especially in areas where I want the white fur to blend up against the darker areas. Just a few strokes will usually be enough to give to soften it out but still keep the detail if you over blend it you just make mush you lose all that detail 
I just want to soften it out in certain areas. Now, you need to be very careful. In a case like this, I am not filling in the background. I don't want any smudges on that background. I don't want any handprints on that background. So one of the things you've seen me use throughout this, that white piece of paper, it's called glassine. And it's pH neutral, acid free, and nothing will really stick to it. So as I move it around, unlike, let's say I was using just a random scratch piece of paper, that random scratch piece of paper, sometimes the charcoal will stick to it. So when you slide it over or move it, it will leave a smudge. This will not. This, you really don't have anything that can stick to it. So it works really well for that. Plus, again, the pH neutral, so that's going to keep the work more archival. And it keeps any oils for my skin off the work. I'm not going to have any smudges there. If you remember the bunny I did not too long ago, I had a smudge. I had a fingerprint on there that I couldn't get rid of. So when you have a background like this, it's extra important that you keep your hands off of that. We don't want little fingerprints or smudges that we can't get rid of. If you were to smudge that, your best case is to go ahead and fill in the background with charcoal because you're never going to get rid of that otherwise. Now here's a case where I put the line in the wrong place. I just blended it out, smudged it out. No problem. Very forgiving medium. If something goes wrong, don't panic. You're not finished yet. Just in that case, I just kind of blended it out and then reworked it. I just had that line above a spot where it should have been under. But it, it is such a forgiving medium that it, if something goes wrong, you can fix it. Don't throw the piece away. Just keep working until it looks good. Or in that case, I just had to smudge it a bit and then layer over it. When I'm done with this piece, I'm going to use a product called SpectraFix, and I put it in a fine mist sprayer so I get a really, really fine mist, and this is how I seal my work down. I find with SpectraFix, I don't have it darken the white areas of the charcoal as much as other fixatives I've used in the past. I really didn't notice. If, if there was a change, it was so minor, I couldn't tell when I, I put the, the fixative on top of this when I was finished. Now, ideally, it's not a bad idea to be spray, spraying your fixative as you go every few layers to really help that, that charcoal to adhe adhere, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, to the paper long term. In this case, I got this done so fast, I honestly just forgot to spray it. Normally, this would be a, a several day project, but like I said, fast with the charcoal and I got it done in that one night. So I didn't spray it until the end, but I did a couple of really light layers and that's gonna be a huge tip. When you mist with your, your fixative, light, light layers. And that's why I use the fine mist sprayer so I don't have those heavy droplets come out or spit out, but really, really light layers. If you go too heavy, you're gonna darken everything up and you're gonna end up having to go back on top of it with your wipes. So here, because I did this in such light layers with the, the fixative, it made no different, no noticeable difference anyway in darkening those colors. And that's why I like it for pastels too. When I use pan pastels, that's definitely the fixative that I like the best. It doesn't cause a real big color shift, which is a really big deal when you spray a fixative on charcoal or on pastels. And there is the finished piece. If you're interested in any of the supplies that I've used for this guy, I will have all of that linked in the video description. Fellow artists, if you are like me and you love painting and drawing frogs, I posted some really adorable photos of my frogs over on my personal MeWe account that you are welcome to use in your own artwork. I'm not above bribing people for friends. Do frog bribes work?
have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's round has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. You may also want to click on the bell notification icon because YouTube is terrible about notifying people when new videos go up. And make sure you're following me over on MeWe where it's, well, it's Facebook if Facebook were still good.